taught you this song last week, and so it's another one that we're going to get to sing today of just about the season of Advent and the coming of our King. So let's sing this together as we go on. Long we've waited with expectation. Long we've prayed with anticipation. But suddenly there is a light in the darkness It's shining in Bethlehem yeah. This is the moment, this is the night Sing for of angels, glory to God He's peace on the earth, it's joy to the world The Savior has come down, and heaven is here You guys stand with us as we continue in worship this morning. What's really cool is after we get to hear these scriptures, we get to sing his praise. There is a sound I love to hear. It's the sound of the Savior's voice as he walks into the room where people pray, where we hear praises here.
celebrate the birth of a king Jesus our Savior it's a day where we worship him and it's a special day today but as we celebrate um, what we call parent child commissioning and um, so that is a day that's uh, you're gonna get to walk through that and there's lots of little ones on the stage and I'm gonna keep scooting down a little bit let me introduce to you Katie Elkin Katie is our children's ministry director and she's gonna introduce all these uh, little guys that are up here with us today. Good morning, church family. It's been an exciting day. We're commissioning 10 families, so four families in this service, but 10 total. So we're excited for you to get to meet these families. And I hope that when you hear their names and see their faces, you will begin to pray for them as they raise their little ones. Let me introduce you to David and Sarah Buckler and their daughter, Evie Noel Buckler. She was born on November 15th, 2019, and her name means full of life and gift from God. 
The scripture her parents have chosen for her is, O oh, give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the peoples, sing to him, sing praise to him, tell all the, of his wondrous works. Glory in his name, let the heart of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Seek the Lord in his strength, seek his presence continually. From 1 Chronicles 16, 8 through 11. Christians and family, this is um, Paul and Hannah. They're bringing two this morning. This is Graham. Graham was born March 18th of this year. His name means from a gray home. They are praying that God may protect him and that he will do um, in Graham and in his home what the Lord's protection and his presence. The verse they have chosen for him is Psalm 73, 28, which says, for his, but, for his me and my, but as for me, God's presence is my good. I have made the Lord God my refuge so I can tell about all of you. She was born in 2016 on July 22nd, and her name means God is my light. The verse her parents have chosen for her is Psalm 27, 1. It says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is my stronghold of my life. Whom should I be afraid? Andrew and Taylor Lambert, they're bringing Everett James Lambert this morning. He was born on August 30th, 2019, and his spiritual meaning of his name is brave and strong. He's joined together with his brother. The verse that his parents have chosen for him is, Be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified or afraid of them. For the Lord your God is the one and who will go with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. From Deuteronomy 31, 6. <laughs> he was born April 21st of this year. His name means brave, strong male, strong as a wild boar. The verse they have chosen for him is be strong and courageous. Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. From Joshua 1, 8 and 9. So at Brainerd, we refer to our time of parent-child commissioning uh, as commissioning because these guys are on mission. Uh, they're committed followers of Christ. And the first place that that mission starts is at home. It's uh, as you raise up these little ones, as they're far from God, that become committed followers of Christ. Psalm 127.3 affirms our belief that each one of these little ones and all of us are a gift from God and that we're created in His image. While God entrusts us to steward these kiddos, He also uh, we also remember that first and foremost, they belong to, to him even before they belong to us. We see this through scripture, that it's appropriate to dedicate them back to God as they are a gift. In 1 Samuel 1, Hannah presented Samuel at the temple to the Lord. In Luke 2, Mary and Joseph presented their baby, dedicated their baby Jesus to the Lord. And while we give thanks to the Lord, we're also entrusted we're, we're also entrusted with the stewardship of these gifts, these kids that God has given us. We find a simple guide for how we're to raise them and model to them what it means to be a committed follower of Christ. In Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 6 says, Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. These words I am giving you today are to be, are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk, talk about them when you sit down in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol 
on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. God's instructions for all of us are clear. We're to love the Lord our God with all of our heart and we're to live and teach our children in such a way that we model to them what it means to be a committed follower of Christ. So parents, by coming forward today with your children before God and before your greater church family, do you wish to dedicate your child, your children, to the Lord and declare before God and your church family your commitment to both teach and model what a committed follower of Christ should look like. If you do, please say we do. Before God and your church family, do you commit to love and follow Jesus personally? Provide your child with a home of Christ-like love and peace. Model to your child what a committed follower of Christ looks like. And with the help of the Holy Spirit, disciple your child to follow Jesus as his personal savior. If you commit to that end, please say we do. Greater church family, I wanna ask you also if you're willing to make a commitment today to these families, just like they've made a commitment to you and to the Lord, we wanna make a commitment to them. As a local representation of the body of Christ, we live on mission together. It's more than showing up and worshiping together for an hour on Sunday morning. It's that we're committed to worship together, to love each other, to serve each other, to encourage each other, to hold each other accountable, and ultimately to be on mission together. If you're willing to make that promise to these parents, the commitment to walk with them on mission together, I would ask that you please stand with me as we make that commitment to them. So please stand. Church family, I ask you to make the following commitment to these families who stand before you to demonstrate your willingness to walk alongside them as they raise their children to be committed followers of Christ. Church, do you commit with the help of God to pray for, encourage, serve, support, provide accountability and model what it means to be a committed follower of Christ as these parents seek to love the Lord and raise their children to be followers of Christ by both word and deed in such a way that these children might one day also decide to follow Jesus as their Lord and Savior. If you accept this responsibility, please respond with a strong, we do. Would you all join me in prayer? Father, we give you thanks, Lord, Lord for your son, his birth on this earth and we give you thanks Lord for these kids that we have before us today we thank you for their parents and Lord we pray a special blessing on them that you would help them Lord to disciple their kids to be on mission while they're at home and Lord we ask you that as a church Lord that you would provide us the courage and the strength the ability to walk alongside them and that we'd be able to celebrate together as these kids one day decide to follow you as well that we would raise up a generation of committed followers of Christ at Rainer Baptist Church. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. faith family and guests. Um, great to see you. Let's study God's word together. Matthew chapter one. Let me ask you to open your copy of the Bible or turn it on and find Matthew chapter one. First book in the New Testament, second major division in your Bible. Uh, Matthew chapter one. We began last week uh, walking through these two chapters. It's some of our focus this uh, Christmas season. Uh, four messages, two out of Matthew 1, two out of Matthew 2. If you don't know where Matthew is, as I said, it's first uh, book in the New Testament, second major division of your Bible, uh, feel free to look in the table of contents if uh, you're unfamiliar with that and uh, find the book of Matthew. We're in chapter 1. I want to welcome those of you that are joining us online. Grateful, all, as always, for your presence. Hope you have a Bible um, close by. Uh, Brainerd, thank you uh, for your part in what you just heard. Um, gosh, what an incredible testimony. I, every time I hear uh, testimonies like that, I just I feel like I'm reading the New Testament uh, and just seeing the, the work of God. And 
Uh, and I look at your lives and the way that you partner together to, through your giving and through your going uh, to, to be a part of his mission. Uh, it just uh, gives me great occasion for gratefulness uh, to our Lord. So thanks, uh, f- thanks for doing that. Matthew chapter 1, uh, beginning of verse 18, just want to tell you straight up, I, uh, I preached this passage uh, of Scripture five years ago this next Sunday here at Brainerd uh, when I was serving as interim pastor uh, before. I wouldn't expect any of you to remember that. Uh, that's why I'm telling you that. Uh, I want you to know that I know that if uh, by chance uh, you... Uh, some of you, uh, you know, have a, a note written in your Bible, uh, it may be the case or something, but, uh, you know, we did it then as a standalone study. Uh, it was just one of several other passages going uh, from different places. So we're going to come back to it now as part of a sequential study uh, to see it in its context and see where it fits in these opening parts of Matthew's gospel. I also want to I want us to approach it a little bit differently than, than I did then. So this is not the same sermon, uh, but it is the same passage of Scripture. And certainly it has the same meaning. Uh, the meaning of a passage of Scripture doesn't change. So let's see what that is. Matthew chapter 1. Uh, Matthew is one of the uh, 12 apostles that Jesus had called uh, to himself. He's the human author here. But he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And so this is the word of the Lord uh, to and for us. Matthew chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. The birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. After his mother Mary had been engaged to Joseph, it was discovered before they came together that she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. So her husband Joseph, being a righteous man, and not wanting to disgrace her publicly, decided to divorce her secretly. But after he had considered these things, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins." Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And here Matthew is quoting from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 7, verse 14. Here's what he says. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will name him Emmanuel, which is translated, God is with us. When Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but did not have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. I want to put a question on the table uh, today uh, for you, uh, for myself, uh, for many of us to revisit who thought about it before, for some of you uh, to process for the first time. On safe ground, putting this question on the table because it actually is a question that Jesus would ask of some of his detractors, his opponents, people who were pushing back against his ministry later in his life. It's recorded in Matthew chapter 22, and this is what Jesus said to uh, the Pharisees, the religious leaders who were opposing him. Really comes in two parts, all aimed at the same thing. He said this, he said, What do you think about Messiah? What do you think about the Christ, the the one that you've been expecting to come in the world? Then he followed it with this question, and this is where he was headed with it. Whose son is he? What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? I would suggest to you that your answer to that question, my answer to that question, has incredible ramifications for our lives. It has ramifications for how we live our lives every day. It has ramifications for where we'll spend eternity. That's how important that question is. What do you think about the Messiah? Whose son is he? You know, in my estimation, church, there, there are a few theological truths in the Bible that if they're true, if they're true, they, they trump everything. I mean, you know, for example, God as creator. If God created the world, if we really believe that, 
then that, that really, uh, you know, it, it tells me that there's a lot of things that maybe I might struggle with, questions about the Bible, questions about, you know, history, like why is there so much suffering in the world? Why, why is there evil in the world? If I believe that God created this and he's sovereign over it, I, I got to believe there's an answer for that somewhere. Let me tell you another one, the resurrection of Jesus. You know, if, if you believe that Jesus really rose from the dead, he really did that, came back to life, then game over, right? I mean, there, there's a lot of questions that we might have, you know, say in life about, well, well, what about the people in a remote tribe of Africa that never hear the gospel? Why would God let them go to hell, you know, and be separated if, they, if they've never heard the gospel? If I believe that Jesus rose from the dead, there's got to be an answer for that. Well, guess what? I think that what is addressed in this passage of Scripture fits into that category. Because you see, it is here that Matthew, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, gives us the account of what we commonly refer to as the virgin birth of Jesus. Now, if that really happened, if that really happened, then it trumps a whole, if I really believe that, it has incredible ramifications. If this one, this one that we call Jesus was really born miraculously without a man and a woman ever having sexual relation, without the medical advancements of uh, artificial insemination or any other way that you know a, a woman might become impregnated. If he, if he came into this world miraculously like that, then it demands a response from my life. And it has implications for everything I do. It has implications for the way I treat my wife, the way a woman treats her husband, the way we shepherd our kids, the way we go to school every day, or the way we go to work, the, the, the way we approach life, if this is true. That, that, that's how important your answer to this question is. And this is not something we can just say, oh yeah, I believe in the virgin birth, and it make no difference for your life. It have no bearing on how I live my life just the same way that the doctrine of creation and the doctrine of the resurrection, we can't really believe those things and then just blow them off if they have, you know, have, have absolutely no bearing on what we do. So Matthew answers the question for us. And he answers it in this account of this miraculous conception of Jesus Christ. He answers the question, whose son is? Is he? You see, when Jesus put that question on the table, the, the, it wasn't necessarily that the Pharisees were entertaining the idea that he was the Messiah. In fact, they were rejecting that. But Jesus just wanted them to process it. He just wanted to process it. Okay, this one you're expecting, this Savior, you know, w w where do you think his origin is? Because that's going to make a difference in how you respond to it. If you believe, he is like any other man. You merely believe he is the son of human beings who've had sexual relationship with one another, then that's one thing. But if you believe, if you believe he is the very son of God, that's got to make a difference in the way that you approach him. So Matthew says he's both. He is fully and wholly the human son of man, and at the same time, the divine Son of God. And through that, Matthew is making an important assertion that ties in with his entire purpose that we started talking about last week. And that is that Matthew is saying that the virgin birth of Jesus Christ was God's demonstration of making good on a promise that he made fulfilling, being faithful to a promise he made a long time ago. And I'm going to show this to you in just a minute. And that is that he would bring an eternal savior king into the world. That's what's happening in this passage of scripture. Now, we pray that Matthew's answer is our answer today. And so that's the reason that I pose it to you and tell you each and every one of us have to respond to this. Your response, my response may be to reject this. I don't believe Jesus was born of a virgin. That's just one of those myths, just like lots of other myths that come out, out of the Bible. That may be your response, total rejection of that. But if you answer the question that he 
is the divine son of God. Brothers and sisters, friends, that demands something from our lives. You can't just leave that hanging. That can't just be some some theological, impotent theological truth out there that we give intellectual assent to and it doesn't affect the way that we live. So here's how I want to slice this. Three major divisions. We'll spend more time on one of them than we will the others, but I want to, you to see uh, Matthew's report of the virgin birth. And then I, I want you to see the reason for the virgin birth, and that's the one that we'll camp out on and lean into a little bit, and then we'll finish by talking about our response to the virgin birth, those, those three years. Let's start with the report. Matthew gives an account of the birth of Christ. There are other gospel writers that do the same thing. Matthew does here. His purpose is in keeping with his larger purpose in the book. Last week, if you were part of the study, you know we, we began this talking about how, how Matthew uh, started his gospel putting a legal document on the table that was part of his case for Jesus of Nazareth being the rightful heir to the throne of Israel. Well, he gives an account now of Jesus not only laying claim to the regal human throne, but laying claim to the divine throne for all people. And that's what he does in the virgin birth. In verse 18, the birth of Jesus Christ came about this way. And so what he does is he tells us a story of basically the pickle that Joseph found himself in one day as a result of this. But I want you to notice something. I want you to notice that, that several things, really. One, Matthew doesn't spend a lot of time building a case for the virgin birth. He doesn't do an apologetic. He's not putting evidence on the table. He's not trying to convince people that it happened. And, and I, I want to be, I I be in line with that today. I want you to know that's not, that's not my, my desire. Matthew wasn't doing that. He wasn't trying to build a defense for this. Doctor. He was simply proclaiming it. And he says it straight up in two places. At the end of verse 18, he says, it was discovered before they came together that Mary was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. He'll say it again at the end of verse 20 when, he, when the angel is telling Mary, don't be, uh, telling Joseph, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. He's just telling us the story. He's, he's announcing, he's throwing it out there, he's not trying to defend it. And he does it, interestingly, by bringing us into Joseph's world. And Joseph's world had, had started falling apart. But here's the deal. I want you to notice that Joseph's world wasn't falling apart because Jesus was supernaturally conceived. He, he, his problem was not how Mary got pregnant. His problem was that Mary was pregnant. You, you, you see, in the Jewish uh, custom... Uh, a Jewish marriage really was uh, the entrance of was composed of two parts. One is called the engagement, and that's what's being referred to here. Much like our understanding of how a couple comes together, they get engaged, they make a commitment to one another. And then the second part was the actual ceremony followed by the consummation of the marriage. So those were the, the two parts. But there's a major difference between their engagement and our engagement. You see, in, in Jewish custom, in Jewish tradition, the engagement was legally binding. They were considered to be married in the engagement. You see that evidence in this passage. Joseph is going to talk about, or is, you know, we're, we're going to be turned on to his intent to divorce her secretly. Well, the only reason that you would have to go through a legal process of divorce is because the engagement was legally binding. So make sure that you have that. Put that back in the story and understand. Joseph discovers that. We don't have any indication that he knew at this point that it was by the Holy Spirit. And the reason we know is because that doesn't come until verse 20 when the angel speaks to him, gives him the explanation. So up here in verses 18 and 19, he doesn't know that. He doesn't know that, 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 that the child's conceived by the Holy Spirit. All he knows is Mary is pregnant. And he draws the only conclusion that, 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 that someone could draw. And that is she's been unfaithful. She's been unfaithful. But Joseph had another problem. His problem of Mary being pregnant wasn't all there was to it. His problem was complicated by another factor. And you know what that factor was? It's a thing called character. You see there in verse 8 to 19, 
So her husband, Joseph, being a righteous man, a just man in some English translations, a man that tried to follow God's law, but more than that, a man that sent Saul following God's law, not just as keeping a bunch of religious traditions or legalistic uh, you know, uh, imperatives, a man who, who tried to live the heart of God as well. And the God that Joseph served was a God of compassion and grace and mercy. And that's what shows up here. Joseph's problem was not just, it certainly wasn't that she was conceived, the child was conceived by the Holy Spirit. He didn't know that. But his problem wasn't just that Mary was pregnant. His problem was compounded by the fact that Mary was pregnant and he was a righteous man. Because you see in Jewish tradition, a a, a woman who had been unfaithful, the, the husband, the husband had the right to do three things. Number one, disgrace her publicly. Number two, divorce her. And number three, demand that she be stoned to death. That's how serious this was. And yet, when you look at verse 19, Joseph wasn't willing to go there. You see, what you find here is a clash between shame and character. And when those two came together, Joseph didn't have any desire to shame her publicly and certainly didn't have any desire to see her killed and her life ended. And so he comes to the conclusion that what he'll do is he'll divorce her offline. He'll he'll divorce her under the radar and they'll go their separate ways and move on with their lives. That's Matthew's report. That's the context in which he gives us that. But he gives us that to bring us to the place that God intervenes. And God intervenes to give Joseph a reason that all of this has happened to explain to him. So we see the report. Let me show you the reason, and I want us to lean in to this. The reason's gonna get get put on the table in two different ways. One, by the intervention of an angel that God sends uh, to explain things to Joseph, and then by Matthew's commentary. And it's Matthew's commentary that really uh, just shows us that this is one of those passages that we don't have to work really hard to understand what it's about and why it's in the Bible. You know, some passages you study in the Bible, we've got to lean into a little bit more and we've got to make sure that we understand every component part there and and we've got to come to a conclusion of of what the meaning is and why it's... But there are some passages that just tell us straight up, this is why this is here. And, And this is one of those passages. Look at it in verse 22. Now, Matthew's going to be speaking at this point and he's going to say, now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And that's where he's going to quote from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. So in a little bit, we're going to circle back around to this, but let me just tell you, whatever this passage is about, whatever the virgin birth is about, it is tied to that passage of Scripture. And Matthew tells us straight up, this is why all this is happening. And so he's going to give us the reason. Now let me give you a little backdrop. A little backdrop is that, that, that he's, he's talking about a promise that God made to his people a long time ago. We have to go all the way back to 2 Samuel chapter 7, verses 12 and 13. Find where God was speaking to King David, and he tells him, I'm making a promise to you. You're not going to build a temple for me, but your son is. But let me tell you what I'm going to do with him. I am going to establish his kingdom forever. Through that, he's telling David, I'm making a promise to you. Your reign is going to last forever and ever. And all the way through the Old Testament, God makes deposits in that and talking about the coming king who would be an eternal king. A, king, a kingdom's got to have a king. And so if there's going to be an eternal kingdom, there's got to be an eternal king. And so all the prophecies about the coming Messiah, this one that would come, are part of this that, that created the, the, the Jewish people's anticipation that God was going to send to them a savior king, this Messiah. Now, I want you to do a little bit of Bible study with me just for a second. I didn't ask you to turn to those passages, but I I want you to turn to a passage because it's close, okay? This is not going to be on the screen. So in your Bible, looking at it, I I want you to go over a couple of books, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. 
I want you to look at the Gospel of Luke chapter 1, and, and, and I want to show you something in the Christmas story in Luke's Gospel, all right? Luke chapter 1, uh, and, and so here we were turned on to another piece that Matthew doesn't talk about, and that is that prior to what Matthew talks about, there was an angel that had appeared to Mary. His name was Gabriel. And, and he's kind of clarifying things for, for Mary and helping her to understand what is going on. Luke chapter 1, and, and, and here's what it says in verse 31. The angel says to Mary, now listen, listen, he says, uh, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. What did Gabriel tell Mary? He, he told Mary, you know, you know that promise God made? Way back there in 2 Samuel, you know all the deposits that he's made along the way and telling you stuff about the, the, the one who would come as the eternal savior king? Guess what? That's going to be the one you're going to give birth to. That's what Gabriel said. Everything here in Matthew's explanation is against that backdrop. It is against the backdrop of God making good, being faithful to that promise. Now I want to make a statement and then I want us to flesh that statement out as we look at Matthew's reason here. Here's the statement. Here's the answer. Listen to me. Come in here real close. Here's the answer that God wants us to have to that question, whose son is he? His answer in this passage of scripture is this. Jesus is the son of God who became a man to provide the perfect sacrifice for our sins and to reign as the promised Savior King forever. That's, what this, that's the reason Matthew gives. Let me say it again. Jesus is the Son of God who became a man in order to provide the perfect sacrifice for our sins and to reign, to reign as the promised Savior, King, forever. Now, I want to break that statement apart and show it to you in this reason here in this passage of Scripture. Let's start with the first part. Jesus is the Son of God who became a man. Look, look at the end of verse 20. So the, you know, the angel is, comes to Joseph in a dream, tells him not to be afraid to take Mary as his wife. Why? Because what has been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. Joseph, your conclusion is wrong. She hasn't been unfaithful to you. What is conceived in her is supernatural. More importantly, it is divine. It's conceived by the Holy Spirit. So he establishes in that statement as well as the previous statement, Matthew gives us back up there in verse 18, before they came together, she was pregnant from the Holy Spirit. He establishes his truth. Jesus is the Son of God. Interestingly, God never refers in the, the accounts in Scripture, he never refers to Joseph as Jesus' father. He never refers to, to, to Jesus as the son of Joseph. You know why? He wasn't. They weren't. Jesus was the Son of God. He is the Son of God. But Matthew doesn't stop there. The angel didn't stop there. Notice the beginning of verse 21. Right on the heels of saying what's been conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit, he says she will give birth to a son. Translated, he's going to come into the world just like any other baby. He's going to be born of a woman. There's going to be a baby there's going to be, you know, recognitions like this. There, you know, there, there, there's going to be families. And she, he's going to be born into to the world, listen to me, as a, as a human being, as a man. And so right there in, in the angel's explanation, he makes this profound declaration that Jesus is the divine son of God, but also the human son of man. Not Joseph's son, but he coming into the world by human processes, he is going, he's, he's going to travel the same journey 
as human beings do. And so the angel tells us this reason for the virgin birth is it begins at this point. And that is the declaration that Jesus is holy, the divine son of God, and he is holy, the human son of man. But the explanation is not over. Let's add the next part to it. Jesus is the son of God who became a man for what purpose? Well, in order to provide the perfect sacrifice for our sins. Not just the God who became a man, but God who became a man for a purpose. Look at it in verse 21. She will give birth to a son, and you are to name him Jesus. The name Jesus was the Old Testament name Yeshua. It means God is salvation or God saves. And so the angel says it, because he will save his people from their sins. And so the angel tells Joseph, he tells him, look, God... Is, is, is going to be born into this world and he's going to be born as a man. He's going to come into this, but he's going to do it for a particular purpose. And that purpose is to save people from their, their sins. Now, beloved, I, I want you to do the math on this, follow on this. You know, the, the Bible indicates to us that the sin nature of human beings, your sin nature, my sin nature, has been passed to us through the seed of of man, in other words, through you know the, the the seed of a father. Women don't have seed, right? Men have seed, and so when there's sexual relation between a man and a woman, and that seed is transferred, and and by God's design, it it creates a baby, it creates a child, and and a, and a woman becomes pregnant. That's the way it happened. But but you see, there's no man involved here, and this goes all the way back. To, to the creation story and the story of the fall. In Genesis chapter 3, verse, verse 15, when God is cursing the serpent or her Satan manifested in the serpent, he, he makes an interesting statement. He said, there's going to come a time when the woman's seed, offspring in some, in some translations, is, is going to go head to head with your seed. In other words, at some point, the woman's offspring and you are going to fight and there's going to be, there's going to be a problem. But the problem is there, women don't have seed. Except God said in Genesis 3.15, there's going to come a day when a woman has seed. There's going to come a day when a woman has offspring not brought by another man and, and, and listen, by, a, by a human being, a man. And, and if the sin nature has been transferred from generation to generation, your, your father uh, passed it on to you. My father passed it on to me. We as fathers pass it on to our children through the seed of man. You take that out of the equation here and what do you have you have a man being born into this world without the seed of man transferring the sinful nature. Beloved, listen to me. Come in here real close. This is why we cannot separate Christmas from Easter. We cannot separate Jesus coming into this world for the reason that he came into this world, which was manifested and played out on the cross because it was there. Watch this. It was there that someone who was perfect and righteous and just went to a cross and there paid for your sin and my sin. He did for us what we cannot do. And all of that comes back to this supernatural birth because he didn't come into this world with a sin nature, a nature that, that made it impure. He came in with the nature of God and he lived the life you can't live. You understand that God's, God's standard for relationship with him, God's standard for getting into heaven is perfection. And there isn't anybody or anything that is gonna step across the threshold of heaven that's not perfect. And if you're processing that honestly, you gotta come to the same conclusion I do and that is I'm in trouble I'm messed up because I don't meet that standard. And you know what God says? I know that, but I do. And that's why Jesus came. And that's why it was necessary for him to be born of a virgin, for him 
to bring the divine nature into this world and live a life you and I can't live because he took that life and he went to a cross and there died a death we should have died for this purpose right here. The purpose of redeeming us, of saving us from our sins. This is why Jesus came. And it all comes back to this virgin birth. Because you see, the Apostle Paul would say to the Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5, in due time, at the right time, Christ was born of a woman, born under the law. Why? That he might redeem those who are under the law. You know why it was important for him to become a man? So he could walk in your steps. He could face the temptations that I face. He could identify with us. He was one of, 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 of us. But he met every one of those with the divine nature of perfection and holiness. And then he took that to the cross. And there he took your sin and my sin. And he incurred the wrath of God against sin. Paul would say it this way to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. He who knew no sin became sin for us. Why? That we might become the righteousness of God. That's why it was imperative that Jesus be born miraculously, not from the seed of a human being, but from the seed of God so that he could do this for you. And so if you ever find yourself, and all of us do, at a place where you're saying, man, I can't live up, I can't make the grade, I wouldn't be able to live the Christian life even if I became a Christian, I can't do that. Beloved, listen, you're in good company. You're in the company of every human being that's ever been born into this world save the person of Jesus Christ because none of us can make the grade. That's why Jesus had to come. That was the reason for this supernatural birth. And so Matthew tells us that Jesus is the son of God who became a man in order to provide the perfect sacrifice for our sins. But he wasn't done. Matthew jumps in here at that point I referenced a moment ago, and he gives us commentary. He brings further clarification in verse 22 when he makes that statement. Now, all of this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And then he quotes from Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. See, the virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son. Here's where Matthew helps put the final piece on it. Jesus is the son of God who became a man in order to provide the perfect sacrifice for your sins and mine and, listen to me, to reign as the promised savior king, divine savior king forever. So let me give you the backstory of Isaiah 7, 14. It's rooted in the reign of the wicked king Ahaz of Judah. He was one of many wicked kings that sat on the throne of Judah during Israel's history, but he may have topped them all. I mean, this guy was so bad, he, he, he set back up all of the idols of false gods that had been taken out of Jerusalem. He put those back. He restored the worship of the false god, the pagan god, Molech, and, and he bought into it, just, uh, just the, the whole nine yards to the point of, listen, if, if, if those don't tell us something, this certainly does. He sacrificed his own son as a burnt offering to this false god. That's how bad he was. Well, at a particular point, there were a couple of neighboring kings, uh, Rezin, king of Syria, Pekah, king of Israel, that decided they wanted to depose Ahaz because they wanted to put a king in, in his place that would do their bidding. And Ahaz got wind of that. So he starts panicking, and, and, and instead of, of turning to God, repenting of his sin and turning to God, he goes and he finds another king, Tiglath-Pileser of, 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 of the empire of Assyria, and tries to recruit his help. And it's at that point that God sends Isaiah. And Isaiah comes, and, and he basically says, and I'm, I'm certainly paraphrasing here, he, he basically says, do you, you really think, you really think God's going to let two or three wicked pagan kings undermine and cancel out the promise that he made so long ago? And he tells Ahaz, God's going to make good on his promise. You, you can trust him. You can turn to him, although Ahaz didn't. 
Many kings after him didn't. He says, you can trust him. And he's even going to give you a sign. You're going to put, put some evidence on the table. And you know what that evidence was? Well, that's when Isaiah said, look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son. And guess what? Matthew is now saying, this is why that's happening. To fulfill that promise that God reiterated to say, look, nothing is going to keep me. Nothing's going to keep me from making good on my promise. But then notice, he says, they will name him Emmanuel. You stop right there and say, well, wait a second. I thought his name was supposed to be Jesus. Oh, it, it was and it is. So you see, this was not a name of a, a, a formality it's by which someone would be called. It's, it's a position <laughs> that he's talking about. He says, this is what they're going to understand him to be. And then Matthew translates it for us. You know what that means? It means God with us. So here's the deal. Here's the deal, beloved. God didn't just make good on his promise in Jesus coming to a virgin birth of, of bringing a Savior King. God is the Savior King. God came looking for us when we weren't looking for him. If any of us and any of the people in this passage of Scripture during this time were looking for him, it was for wrong reasons. Jewish people looked for a Messiah that, that, that was going to come in and defeat the Romans and, and reestablish them to their, their place as a great nation. Many people today, that they want to look to God to take away all their problems, make their life easier, give them all the money that they want, answer their prayers when it's convenient, and they want to, to pray them. Oh, there are people that look for God to come, but they look for all the wrong reasons. But let me tell you something. God came looking for you, and he came looking for me for this purpose, for this reason, to be that divine Savior King who would do something about your sin and do something about my inability to establish a relationship with God, to do something about the fact that we couldn't establish a relationship with God that would last for any time at all, much less eternity. He came looking for us. And beloved, listen, he came to us through this supernatural birth. He came to us demonstrating that Jesus is the son of God and he became a man to, to provide the perfect sacrifice for our sins and to reign forever and ever as his promised Savior King. That's what this passage is about, more importantly. That's what this event in history is about. Couldn't have happened any other way. That brings us to the response. It's our response, but it's our response that I, I pray is prompted by Joseph's response in this text. Look at your Bible. Verse 24 is pretty simple. Verse 24, when Joseph woke up, he did as the Lord's angel had commanded him. He married her, but he didn't have sexual relations with her until she gave birth to a son, and he named him Jesus. Let me translate that for you. He just did what God said. He just believed God and did what he said. Now, let me call your attention to the fact that Jesus, Joseph didn't have a sonogram. And even if he had had a sonogram, he wouldn't have had any way to to make the medical connections, any DNA tests to be able to determine this wasn't really Joseph's son, this had to be God's son. He didn't have any of that. God spoke through the angel and Joseph just said, okay, and he obeyed it. You see, beloved, listen to me. Come in here real close. That's what faith is. People have redefined faith today as just believing something hard enough you know, if you believe something strong enough, you just have faith. Well, listen, you don't just have faith. You have faith in something, all right? And, and you, know what you, you know what real faith is rooted in? It is rooted in what God says. In other words, God speaks. We hear it, and we say, okay, you're God, and I'm not. I'm going with you. And that's what we're compelled to here, beloved. We're compelled to a faith response to what God said in this passage of Scripture. No, I, I get it. 
It doesn't provide all the scientific or historical or tangible evidence that we might like to have, but if we put any credence in this being the Bible, the Word of God, and we put any credence in that what it gives testimony is true, meaning that Jesus was born of a virgin, that he came into this world as a supernatural birth, then God has spoken. That's on the table. And what we're compelled to is a faith response to say, you're God, I'm not, and I'm going with what you said. Now, there's only two kinds of people in the room today. There's only two kinds of people watching on the internet. One is a group of people that haven't yet believed that Jesus is the supernatural Son of God who came into the world to provide the perfect sacrifice for our sin and to reign as the promised Savior King forever. Beloved, if that's you, you you are, are called. I'm inviting you, I'm pleading with you to a faith response today. And that faith response is something like this. By faith, trust Jesus as this Savior King. Trust Jesus as your Savior King. By faith, you may not have all of your questions answered. You, you, you may not, not have all of the, you know, the, the spiritual sonograms that you want to have or DNA tests, but God in his grace has given you enough faith to believe that this is his word and he has spoken this and he's really done it. And if that's the case, beloved, I plead with you by faith, say yes to that. Change your mind about what you've thought about Jesus up to this point. Change your mind about what you've thought about your sin and how serious or how not serious it is. And buy into what God says and by faith, trust Jesus. And I pray before you walk out of this room or before you turn this broadcast off in your heart of hearts, right where you are, you will in your own words tell him that. Jesus, I know who you are. I know who you are and I know who I am. And I know that I need to trust you to do something for me I can't do for myself. I'm, I'm trusting you as my Savior King. I want to invite you to do that today. Let today be your spiritual birthday. And I hope if that's what your heart's telling, you'll not only do it, but you'll tell somebody about it. Tell somebody in this room before you leave here. Tell a, a family member, a friend that's a Christian. Tell one of the pastors in this church. Tell somebody. That's, that's the commitment I made today. But you see, there's a lot of us in the room, a lot of us watching today that we've been there. We've done that. We have already, at some point in our past, we have by faith trusted Jesus as our Savior King. You, you understand that we're, we're compelled to no less of a faith response to this reality of the virgin birth today. You say, well, what is it? Well, I think it's simply this. Because of faith, proclaim this Savior King to everybody you can. Because of your faith, because of my faith, proclaim and tell everybody you can. about If this is true, you remember what I said? If the creation is true, the resurrection is true, if the virgin birth is true, this calls us to something different. It compels us you know, to, to live our lives differently, to have a different purpose. If we had time this morning to take you over to the end of Matthew's gospel. Many of you are familiar with it. Matthew closes his gospel the same way he starts it. He starts it by putting legal evidence on the, on the table for Jesus to have, be, have a rightful stake to the throne of Israel. Do you know where he ends it? Jesus comes to his disciples before he ascends back into heaven and he says this, all authority in heaven and earth is given to me. Translated, I'm the king. I'm not only the king of Israel, I'm the king of the universe. And I'm the king of every single person's life that's ever lived and ever will live. That's what he said. And then he gave his followers the commission, go make disciples. Go tell everybody about me. But he didn't do it without a promise, did he? You remember the last, the last words in Matthew's gospel? And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Connect the dots on that. Emmanuel, God with us. Jesus said to his followers, I'm sending you leverage everything you've got to tell as many people. And today, those of us listening to this message, we've got family members. Some of them live under our same roof that we know don't, don't, don't know Jesus. They've never committed. If the world ended right now, or Jesus came back right now, they would spend eternity separated from God and hell. We know that. 
We might convince ourselves sometime that because they went to church sometime or they call themselves a Baptist, that, that they're going to somehow get in by osmosis. But when we put our heads on our pillows at night, we know, we know it's not true. We know unless they put their faith in this Savior King, they'll spend eternity separated from God. In hell, we've got people that are related to us. We've got friends, we've got neighbors, we've we got acquaintances, we've got team members, fellow students, co workers in the next cubicle. We've got, we've got, we've got people that live in our neighborhood. We, we've got people that we're aware of, like we talked about on this video earlier, across the, 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 the oceans that have never heard the name of Jesus, and, and they're part of our journey. They're part of this commission, and yet the whole time Jesus has said, just like I have come. Is Emmanuel to be God with you. I, I am Emmanuel in your life, and now I want you to go and you be incarnate in the lives of people that need to hear about Jesus. So, believers in Christ, when we revisit the story of the virgin birth this the, the, this Christmas season, we can't be neutral. It's got to compel us to end game to why this story is in the Bible. He saved us from our sins. Now let's. Resolve to tell everybody we can about him. I'm going to ask you to bow with me. Would you just take a moment to do that? Those of you that don't know Christ, those of you that have never trusted him, would you, would right now in your heart of hearts, would you, would you repent of your sin and you'd place your faith in Jesus? I invite you to do that. Believers in Christ, we resolve afresh this morning based upon this story of Jesus' miraculous conception. We resolve afresh to leverage everything in our lives to tell as many people as we can about it. Would you make that commitment to him right now? God, we come to you with grateful hearts, people praying to you all over this room, people praying to you in living rooms and kitchens, maybe even on the road. Lord, we, we're glad that you're able to hear all of those prayers and decipher every single request and every single heart. Lord, as you hear that and you receive our, our hearts cry to you, would you show yourself strong? Would you give us courage where we haven't had courage before? Would you give us boldness? Would you give us faith? We want, Lord, to live our lives for you because of what you have done for us. Help us with that, Lord, now, we pray. We invite you to stand to your feet. Let's worship the Lord through song, through instrument, through our voices, and let's proclaim our worship of Him. Sing this out together. Sing. So my life you have in faith. In home my life you have in soul. So Every breath that I am able, I will sing of the goodness of God. We we'll sing of His goodness. Let's we'll sing. Your goodness is running after. It's running after me. Your goodness is running.
rejoices. So my life you have in faith. Oh my life you have in so, so good. Every breath that I make, I will sing of the goodness of God. I will sing. The goodness of Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Dr. Shaddix. If you're a guest here, you've heard uh, part of a series of our Advent, the coming toward the birth of the Christ. The teaching is focused on that. And uh, it's the greatest story ever told, the greatest narrative ever written. And today we've got application got truth with application and so I encourage you to take it walk with it uh, there are other events happening on this campus today there's music um, uh, keyboards for Christmas there's some other musical events taking place next week you may want to think about how you could involve those around you in the events of uh, the Christmas season I want to leave you with a verse of scripture found in Psalms 111 it says great are the works of the Lord they are studied or they are by all who delight in them and another term there it may be used as pondered wouldn't it be great if during this very difficult time in our past year that we would be be accused of pondering the things of the lord may, may we be accused of that so i pray that would be for us today you have a great week god bless you